Was that okay? Can I go ahead? Good, good. Okay, great. Morning, everyone. Um, I'd just like to introduce John Blaine. He's a very, uh, mostly very well-known exploration geologist, one of the most experienced that I've ever come across. John studied at UCT around 1968, qualified there, went back later to his MSc, um, and spent most of his working career with Falconbridge, which was an, uh, a very well-known exploration company. Um, I think they've been consolidated with someone else in the interim. So um, some of you may not be familiar with Falcon, which was they were very good and a very successful exploration company. Um, John, as a student, um, he worked um, in the Eastern Cape area and was um, instrumental in citing um, the first onshore oil exploration borehole, which um, was, I'm not sure about the success, but we can ask John about that. But that was quite an achievement even as a student. There, after he went on and spent 34 years with Falcon Bridge, in, mostly in Southwest Africa, Namibia, Botswana, South Africa, Canada, Greenland, Zimbabwe, <laughs> Tanzania, Siberia, and obviously Uppington, where all good exploration geologists come from. If you don't pass through Uppington, you can't classify yourself as an exploration geologist. So yes, John was, John's traveled wide and far and um, and spent many years in the in the exploration industry. Um, mostly was on diamonds in Botswana. He worked in Botswana on diamonds, I think, from 1975 to 1988, and made huge discoveries there under thick sand cover. Um, he also worked on nickel, PGNs in the bushveld, gold, uranium in Namibia and in Botswana, and various other exploration projects. After, after retiring from Falcon Bridge and working for, he then worked for some Canadian junior companies and um, Australian junior companies, mostly in Southern Africa, Mozambique, again, Botswana, Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe Zambia, Namibia, and did a, a, had a major input in in various nickel and uh, PGM and uranium discoveries and, and uh, projects in those areas. Um, John was one of the really the first pioneers of exploration. I mean, he worked. The Kalahari is rough today. It was rougher even then. You try and work in the Kalahari without a, a GPS or a cell phone. Um, and communications and logistics and bad roads or no roads is very, very challenging. And to do that is not easy. John was one of the successful guys that managed that and managed discoveries. So one really needs to take your hat off to him and we'll hear about some of his experiences this morning. John retired in 2014. He's now living in, in um, Hermanus and uh, still still involved in, in geology in various ways, um, now giving, giving time and um, experience back to the industry. So let's hear from John. Thank you, John. Um, we look forward to your talk. Oh, thanks, Alan. That was, uh, that was a lot more than I put in my short CV, but uh, thank you very much for all the kind words. And uh, <laughs> um, I think I've got to give a lot of credit to to the many other people who worked with us in the Kalahari and who in fact were most of the, the guys who really got their hands dirty. But uh, the few times that I was able to go out there and really um, put my head's worth in it, it was uh, definitely worthwhile and a very exciting experience. So this is uh, the story of Falconbridge's uh, discovery of, of uh, more kimberlites than diamonds in Botswana in 1975 to 1988. The opening slide there is an aerial perspective view which shows the sort of outline of the Arapa um, uh, um, waste dump on the horizon. So you've got to be careful in Botswana how high you build your, your waste piles to get them show up. Not changing. Why is it not changing? Oh, here we are. 
The, uh, the graphics are courtesy of my daughter, Amy, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll have to take them as they are. Just a little background to Falconbridge, who no longer exists. Um, it was founded in 1928 by, by Thayer Lindsley, who is very famous in that part of the world. And he, and he, uh, he did that uh, to establish the nickel, the nickel production, uh, mining production entity at, at Sudbury. Uh, in competition with, with international nickel, which was American only. Uh, Thayer Lindsay was a very famous explorer worldwide, and uh, he pushed Falkenbridge's early, early activities into Africa with early work in the Free DRC, Tanganyika, Northern Rhodesia, uh, Southern Rhodesia, and Uganda, where in fact they operated the Kalembi cobalt mine for quite a long time until the Idi Amin took over. In Southern Rhodesia, they, they had a couple of gold mines and the blanket mine, which they operated for, for about 30 years um, was eventually sold and, uh, and is currently still being mined by Caledonia. And the mine itself is a, a greenstone operation that's been going for over a hundred years and is a, a really amazing place to visit. In the early seventies, they got involved in Botswana um, and, and took over activities at the Bushman and Matsutama copper deposits and the Nakabezi uranium prospect. Also did a lot of work around, in gold around Francistown, the Matmora prospect, and made discovery down at Signal Hill. And in the 70s, 80s in South Africa, they got involved with uh, Lonro at Western Platinum and with Superior Oil, who were their, their major shareholder. Um, they developed the low sulfur smelting and uh, uh, technologies for smelting low sulfur ores, particularly the UG2 and the Boschfeld complex. And that actually uh, revolutionized a lot of the, uh, the, the PGE um, production in, in South Africa. And there's actually very little known. Sadly, they sold out in 1986 due to political pressure. Um, and that basically withdrew them from South Africa. But in the meantime, Chris Jennings, who we probably all know of, uh, joined uh, Falkenbridge in Johannesburg. He'd, been, he'd served uh, with the Georgeville Survey in Botswana at the time of the discovery of Arafa and, uh, and um, Joining. And um, in fact, did his PhD on the groundwater hydrogeology of Botswana. So um, he had a very interesting, varied background, but his main interest was in geophysics. Just to finalize what happened to Falconbridge, well, in 2006, the, the, Falcon, uh, the Falconbridge merged with a major Canadian company, Duranda, in 2001. In 2006, it was bought out by Extrata. And then a couple of years later, Extrata was acquired by Gencore, and the name Falconbridge disappeared, except for the Falconbridge Township and town near Sudbury in Ontario, which is still home to many of the workers on the ongoing mines and prospects, which is still very active area. So to Botswana, I'm going to give you a bit of the background, uh, how, we, how we began. Uh, we've got a, we kick-started the operations of some, some sort of story around Molopo and Sabong and the discovery of the M1 Kimberlite. Another major area was Kang Kapong, innovation in the technology that we used, uh, implementation of that technology, in the central Kalahari, the discovery of particularly a number of Kimberlites uh, and also the unexplained Dutri anomaly E, and then the, the Gopi 25 Kimberlite, which, was, which contains an interesting amount of diamonds. Towards the end, there was a, the, the Gopi 25 evaluation, eventually, it was game over and was all taken over by another company, the Beers and Parkinburg sold out and we come to some conclusion. Just to show the areas. Uh, in Botswana in a broad sense. Um, there's the Molopo, the Bong area in the south, uh, the Kang Kukong area, and our central Kalahari area, and the two the Beers operating areas, Arapa and Joining, which were, um, were known at the time. So it's in, interesting individuals, um, and I'm privileged to have worked with these guys. Chris Jennings, um, he was an inspirational fellow into the background of, of geophysics and groundwater and stuff. He really knew how to, to, to tell a nice story and um, 
his interest in diamonds um, was was developed all on his own, but in his background in Botswana, and he didn't have any any really side input from anybody else to, to develop the story. And the document that he sold to the shareholders was something that we could all do, uh, draw and benefits from. The other major partner, uh, significant contributor was Hugo Dummett, uh, who was then with Superior Oil. Uh, Hugo is also a South African. Um, and they were a majority shareholder in Falconbridge. Um, when it all fell apart, he then joined BHP Canada. And in fact, he was a originally motivated of matching diamond program in the US for, for superior oil, but then subsequently with BHP, he'd gone to make the major discoveries in Canada. And John Gurney, we all know as well, he's the scientific brain and he was the key to the story. Um, and without him, I don't think we would have really managed to, to, to do the work we did in terms of honing in on the, on the Kimberlites we discovered that were in fact um, the most important one. And then at the, to finish the story, the two presidents of Superior Oil and Marsh Cooper um, were, are in fact, uh, if you don't have those guys providing the money and who buy into your programs, well, you don't go anywhere. And I think we all know that. So at an early stage, we had a, um, had a big meeting down in Sabong, and there you can see some of the characters, um, uh, the, the circled ones, the prime movers is, is Hugo Dummett and Chris Jennings and Bond Gurney. Andy Moore in the middle there. Um, there's Roger Billington, who was one of the major contributors in the, in, at the time um, in, in the field. Uh, Bruce Cumming, I think, was the other one, and he's not there, but I think he took the photograph. Um, so those are all, all uh, um, were terrific people to work with. Um, so Chris Jennings suggested that the company should consider diamond exploration in its Southern African programs. At that time, De Beers had just made the discoveries at the Ralph and John Ning. And uh, these two, as you know, are some of the most important in the world. But not much had know, had, was known at the time about De Beers' exploration techniques. Um, we knew it was based on, uh, on discovery of recovery of timberlithic heavy minerals. And as you recall, as I mentioned, Falconbridge was not a, a diamond company, it was a nickel company, a base metal and gold company. So this was all new. In Botswana, of course, the Kalahari sand cover can exceed 100 meters in the areas which we work, is anywhere between 50 and 80 meters. And this effectively forms a screen for everything uh, below and covers nearly two thirds of the country. But Chris, as a geophysicist, believed in aeromagnetics and he thought it should be used more extensively in the search for Kimberlite. Um, right, right at the beginning, the Falconbridge's first Kimberlite program was in, executed south of Arafa, a non sewer pan. Um, this was before De Beers uh, was, was in fact giving up Kimberlites they had discovered in that area. But anyway, we proceeded in the most prospective area at the time where there was available ground. But it, uh, it was a very wet year, and uh, some of the mag follow-up was in fact done on sewer fans and canoes by Tommy Walker and Dave Johnson. Now, John Gurney at that stage, uh, apart from being a professor at, uh, at uh, UCT, he was, had a, was involved with a small um, geochemical services company in, in South Africa, in Cape Town, and they were doing routine soil geochemical soil geochemical sample processing at our Elba copper prospect near Okaanya. And um, uh, when our manager there in, in Southwest heard that John uh, identified the geochemical criteria for discriminating between diamond metal and barren kimberlite, and that he was available, John, uh, to his, some credit, I guess, never sold his soul to to uh, the big diamond industry. He, he kept very independent, and I think that gave him access to, to far much more, uh, which was a great assistance. Anyway, he was con contracted to provide these services exclusively to Falcon with his superior oil and put together a, a Kimberlite indicator geochemistry research program involving the collection of a large number of barren and diamond different Kimberlite samples from all over the world. 
and this provided and through the the, uh, the heavy, heavy mineral separations out of these samples and the, the microprobe analysis of those kimberlitic heavy minerals um, it was able to provide a, a huge amount of information that is the, the key to this um, technology uh, which was was used going forward so that operation was so secret that only three copies were ever produced um, I know where one is, and I have no idea where the others are. So, but in actual fact, the technology eventually leaked out into the, into the wide world as, as successes were made. And uh, there are many variations of that same technology which are in use today. But far from the success in discovering 62 kimbites, some of which were diamond different, in four fields in Botswana between 1977 and 1984. Um, it was largely due to Christian's geophysical expertise, John Gurney's Timberlite uh, indicator mineral geochemistry, and fundamentally the high level of prospectivity of Botswana. So, in 1976, uh, Economic Geology uh, produced a, a paper, had a paper which included one on the, on the, on the, uh, Kimberlite prospectivity of Botswana and produced these two maps, which actually shows the results of the bears um, heavy mineral sampling in eastern Botswana and these clusters of heavy minerals up here around Arapa, here around Joining, and then two unexplained clusters here around Kankakong and down here around Molopo Sabon. And it was those two areas which had not been followed up by the Beers because they focused on Joning and the Rapa. And in fact, their discovery of Joning probably led them to abandon their work in these areas. Um, and also probably what they had learned from the geochemical signage of, of the heavy minerals they discovered, that they decided Joning was a, a higher priority. But anyway, that gave us our lead in to uh, Malapo Sabong and the Kang Kukong area. So we undertook uh, air magnetic, ground magnetic surveys, soil sampling, drill testing, and a fairly rapid sequence discovered 30 kimberlites at Molopo, 21 at Kapong. Um, and at Molopo, that includes the M1 kimberlite, which is an area of 180 to 200 hectares, and it still is the world's largest, in an area which De Beers had not discovered any kimberlite. And this was uh, an area covered by about 50 meters of Kalahari sand. Um, we also brought in the introduction of the dual wall rotary reverse circulation technology from Canada, which resulted much quicker, more effective drill evaluation compared to the traditional cable tool drilling methods, or the mobilization of bulky, um, not fit for purpose, conventional air percussion rig in the Calari, which, which uh, is why many of the, much of the early work, drilling work done by the Beers and Vulcan, which was done with jumper drills. But drilling with the air percussion, trying to get reliable sample material for, for uh, diamond uh, evaluation is not the recommended way to go. So our surveys of uh, the known De Beers uh, Kimberlite anomalies were flown with these sort of uh, aircraft, which is sort of state of the art back in the 70s. This is a Catalina flying boat flown by Geoterics. And these, our surveys were flown at 500 meter line spacing and at 180 meter, 150 meter flight height above the ground, to which you can add another 50 to 80 meters of Kalahari cover. The flight line recovery was, was done manually from videotape onto 125,000 one uh, photo scale, uh, scale photo laydown. You're probably familiar with those, many people of the older generation. And the plotting of the plan contours was done by hand. And the early, but the early identification virtually as the, 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 the flight data strip came off the press, they were scanned by Chris Jennings and, and I would say 90% of all the targets that we investigated were in fact picked off those strips. So we, it was very rapid and, and Chris was right up front with, with identifying targets. Subsequent work in the Molofo Sabong area, particularly by Firestone Diamonds, of course, have identified a large number of targets, but uh, of additional targets. Um, the Falkenbridge Kimberlites are outlined in white, and the Falkenbridge targets are outlined in white, and the ones by Firestone in, in uh, darker color, I think black or red, and slightly colorblind. Um, 
but the uh, but their saver has shown, of course, new technology, 200 meter line spacing, 50 meter um, um, light height, and that's just uh, just this more detail, more results, more um, more target. And I think this became as much of a challenge for them as it even did for us. But um, they said they they stated, of course, the bong is one of the largest diamond different kimberlite fields known containing 70 kimberlites, of which 17 have been proven to be diamond differs. I think that's a little bit optimistic. Diamond differs can include micro diamond, um, of which we also had experience, but we learned a lot about that as well. But uh, just, uh, I guess, an aside, the, the M1 kimberlites, are perhaps if it had been 20 or 40 kilometers to the east and would have fallen properly within the Craton, the Carpwell Craton, it might have been a different story. But anyway, the Bonk field contains five kimberlites, each larger than 50 he hectares, and 30 kimberlites between 20 and 50 hectares. So it's, uh, it's quite a remarkable place for kimberlite. Sadly, they're all undercover, so not easy to, to investigate. Anyway, in 1979, or the first discovery was in 1977, in fact, just over the border at Rush near McCarthy Trust, which is part of the same field. Um, Sabong was a, a kind of like a two, a two horse, or it wasn't even a horse town, there was actually a camel post there, a police camel post, which was uh, used uh, in those days for patrol. And um, um, nowadays, it's quite a bustling little village, and if any, I can recommend a little stopover place at the old police camp as a as a place to stop over on the way to the, the Falakadi Park, and um, and drive the far roads the whole way instead of having to bang your vehicle out on those roads in the northern Cape. But that was that's the difference between Sabong then and Sabong now. So the, the Monopo, the M1 Kimberlite. Um, as you can see here, it's very subtle. Very subtle. This is from the Aramag data at the time, hand contoured, hand drawn. There's this feature here, which is just a perturbation on the general sort of low, low, uh, low noise background. And that would have been another another one up there. Up there. Another one down there, maybe. Here's another one, another one there. And that's the type of roads that we, we, we had to use. Kalahari, as you know, is just, uh, very typical of the Kalahari in that part of the world. Pollock Recce on these, uh, overnight fly camping in winter. Interesting stuff. Ground mag traverses using toilet paper to mark your lines because it's degraded easily. Scoop soil sampling for cumulative heavy minerals. And then those scoop samples were then transported to our early versions of, of, of PBE recovery, the tetrabromoethane process, uh, which we set up in makeshift tents and found even in the Falkenberg Johannesburg boardroom. But in retrospect, it was not a good idea as the tetrabromoethane, as you know, is highly poisonous. But uh, the gentleman on the right here is a good example of how we carried out our, our, uh, our um, ground magnetic surveys with the old uh, geometric uh, but that was great fun. Great, great fun. Tighting boreholes, you know, no GPS. You really had to use your ground mag survey and um, work from the basic grid of figuring out where the peak of the anomaly was and then traverse halfway there to the, to the, to the, to the associated magnetic low and sight your borehole and away you went. The early drilling was done by people like Butterbeth and John Rich who had the name of John Potts, or obviously, and they were characters in early Kalahari drilling. Um, Buttevet and his company and sons went on to really develop uh, amazing technology for, for large-scale fuel wall reverse circulation, uh, drilling of timberites and other bulk sampling uh, programs. We had lovely early camps, simple camps, tents, open fires, fuel in 44-gallon drums, but then as we got success, you know, the visitors started to arrive. Fortunately or unfortunately, uh, Sabong had an airstrip. And there's the Beechcroft Baron coming in. Um, we eventually had a few caravans. There were some Land Rovers around. Otherwise, we were some of the early users of, of Land Cruiser in the Kalahari. We learned something about Land Cruiser in those days, and so did Toyota, that 
continual hammering on corrugated roads does not hold the transfer based gearbox together very well. So they did some modifications and added some extra bolts to strengthen that up. The, the drilling and sampling was uh, pretty basic. Uh, jumper drilling, as you can see, there's a six inch diameter drill there. With the plunger, this plunger thing here is like a, like a you drop that down, the sludge all goes up into the, into the tube. And as you lift it up, that closes the, uh, closes the barrel and you push it up and into the sample into the bucket. Uh, later on, um, this is actually similar technology. It's hard, so it works, and it's uh, easy. Uh, and it's messy. Uh, in the top left, you see the sort of panning sludge for Kimberley heavy minerals and for logging of, of fragments which might be recovered. One of the early indicators, uh, if you didn't get Kimberley heavy minerals, was the presence of flogger pipes in the slope. So that's just, I remember when Chris Jennings spotted that, he was highly excited. So there's more detailed, uh, there's the ground gravity image for, for the M1 Kimberlite. On the right is a section that, uh, from, from Firestone, which is their, their, uh, from their additional drilling. Falconbridge drilled, drilled a number of core drill holes down to this level here. And recovered a number of, uh, of fine diamonds out of that. It had a very thick uh, epiclastic fill or reworked timberlite from the surrounding explosive tippering. Um, and that uh, effectively creates a bit of a barrier to sampling the, the, uh, the primary timberlite. And as we found that that, uh, that uh, epiclastic material had its own sorting process, and uh, there was a, a very relatively thin, uh, gravelly. Uh, lag deposit in there, particularly around the edges, which which did have more uh, micro diamonds in them than elsewhere. So right at an early stage, when start, it was a challenge, uh, more than 200 meters to to get to the primary timberline. That uh, um, the date the date was on on zircons, uh, uranium dead date on zircons uh, from that timberline came at 77.5. Just a couple of uh, hippies are clear. The top left hand one is just the intersection of the Kalahari sand, all calcutized. And then you go into the below, into the, the sedimentary facies um, and the reddish uh, sandy spot into a very clay rich material. Then you've got this capacious bedded material. And then further down, you get into the capacious volcanoclastic facies. Um, which are sort of like the volcanic breccia within the throat of the pipe. So there were a lot of activity, sometimes of course in rainy seasons, and it did rain there. You get stuck in the mud with the barren, you have to put it out and hopefully try and take off in that. Had some hairy episodes there, lots of helpers. Visitors around you loading up and hauling around in land cruisers, viewing the drill sites, and uh, of course you have to feed them all. And there's a number of people in there who not with us anymore, but uh, they had a great time. We all had a great time. We tried some of the, the open hole um, uh, air percussion drilling. The Maibo from Kruman was one of our early, early uh, assistants there. And that, that land cruiser is in fact pulling that truck or helping to get it through the sand. It was a 15 inch diameter open hole down the hole hammer which we used for our early bulk testing on M1. The sample went through a cyclone, um, a, split, a cyclone and then a splitter to uh, capture four different samples. It's pretty rough and ready, handmade, homemade. And then went into this, this, uh, this mobile uh, screen, a mobile bulk sampling plant was developed by Parkinbridge uh, and, uh, and, uh, and um, a local, not local, a Johannesburg engineering company, which involved a, a milling system, which is the, 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 the scrubbing or the, the, the cement that is on the back that broke up the broke up the lumps of kimberlite that came out, and scrubbing it and screening it there. And this was all in one long trailer, and on the end there was a, a, a Sortex machine. Probably the first ever Sortex machine that went into the environment like this, and it was actually a a forerunner of many Sortex machines and one of the early 
once we got it. Everything was very basic. Water supply was a big issue. And in fact, the water supply, we discovered that if you don't have good clean water, the Sortex machine doesn't tend to work too well because in, in the air jet, you get a sudden deep compression and the crystallization of any salts in the water. So we had to do a lot of water cleaning, purification, and so on to get that to work properly. But many seeding experiments with cement bombs containing uh, irradiated cut diamonds thrown down these holes, um, drilled out, put through the processing. So we the, the system worked, the process worked, but sadly there was not another diamonds. So during the same time, uh, work was busy at Kang Kokong where we, we implemented the first uh, dual wall reverse circulation system from, uh, from Calgary in Canada. It was an oil well drilling system. They brought out their own crew, uh, two drillers, had six local helpers, and these guys did absolutely everything. Um, very rapid uh, progress, uh, fantastic sample recovery, uh, rapidly evaluated more than 70 targets probably in, this, in, in less than a year. Of which 21 Kimberlites were discovered um, at Kokong uh, in, a, in a rather more noisy magnetic background. So we had to do a lot of uh, surface loam sampling around detailed gravity uh, gravity surveys to to get early confirmation. Some of our some of our early attempts at at, uh, at recovering Kimberly heavy minerals in in Johannesburg was done at at a commercial laboratory, and our very first uh, First recoveries created a lot of excitement. There were all of these beautiful, fresh chromites coming out in these soil samples. And we were kind of like, how is this possible? We looked around. The place was also used for processing Kim, uh, chromite ore from the bush belt. There were just drums of chromite ore around and just the dust it was so contaminated that we that led to us establish our own setup in Gaborone. Anyway, in Kokong, there's the second largest Kimberlite found, was the KN70 at uh, 80 hectares, and that had a significant number of microdiamonds, uh, probably an order of magnitude more than we've discovered at, uh, at uh, Molokai. All of this microdiamond story is another one which is uh, fascinating as well. Anyway, that's a Kokong field from a, from a more recent uh, image, also from Petra Diamonds. We did some additional work there. There are now 76 Kimberlites in that area, average size 38 hectares. Also late Cretaceous age, equivalent to Malopa, but with a lot of preserved sediments and also between 80 to 120 meters of color are recovered. So a, a, a significant challenge for, for evaluation. Um, fortunately, uh, Kang Village had, a, had a, uh, an airstrip at Lahari Pan, which is in the background. So we had lots of visitors. Roger Billington, who was the geologist on site um, with, with a number of others, um, he was a great exercise fanatic. So that's uh, Roger going out for his, his morning run. The, the camp there was far more permanent and um, lots of cement buildings, so it made it more comfortable. Um, once again, early visitors, uh, that's still with the tents up. That's the loam sampling, clearing out uh, uh, sort of a two meter by two meter square and, and lifting out everything down to about uh, two and a half centimeters. Um, and then uh, splitting that and uh, sieving that down to, to, to uh, I think it was about 45 microns, half a, half a millimeter, and uh, heavy mineral uh, separation of those soil samples. We did get rain, and uh, you have a few visitors after rain. Those huge bullfrogs that come out of a completely dry pan, it's quite an eye opener. They spend the next three weeks trying to propagate and then disappear again. Anyway, SDS drilling, were our, that was their first uh, big job, uh, which was successful and very mobile. Um, everything was mounted on uh, in 4x4 and 6x6 Mercedes trucks including their accommodation, which is a very well-serviced uh, kitchen and, and cabin and a book and a, and a, and a chef included. Um, eventually, SDS, the, the program was sold to the, the, the local company was sold to, or the, the local company was sold to board drilling. And then uh, with the vet drilling, uh, developed the, the larger diameter uh, dual wall reverse circulation 
or bulk sampling is called, uh, they call their elephant floor. So technology that Falkenbridge brought into Botswana in the, mid, in the late 70s went on to, to assist local drilling companies there to, to develop actually world, world leading technology. We established a dedicated kimberlite and micro diamond extraction laboratory in Gaborone, which was, uh, which was very systematic and required a lot of, uh, a lot of testing, uh, but was done all from scratch. Kimberlite's indicated mineral samples were screened, uh, heavy liquid separated, and grains as small as, uh, as a quarter of a millimeter were picked from by microscope. These were dispatched to John Gurney for microprobe analysis. For micro diamonds, uh, once again, the milling and cement mixes, the TBE separation, then non magnetic separation and trans magnetic separators, microscope picking, and that case down to as small as 0.15 millimeters uh, grain. And these were dispatched to Lakefield Research, which was Falkenbridge's in house uh, research laboratory in, in uh, Lakefield, Canada, uh, where they, in fact, developed the final recovery process for, for uh, micro diamonds. Um, and then in, in essence, that micro diamond uh, uh, technology was developed by Lake Field, which is now part of the SGS group and is used worldwide by them and probably by others, but uh, we're proud to be in such a way. So we learned a lot in the first two years um, and decided that uh, to, to push us into the areas where no man had gone before in the exploration sense. It was an area that had not been covered by the beers, and it was basically the central Kalahari game reserve. Uh, the unexplored area between Arafa and Joneng mines. And we applied a, a reconnaissance license of 78,500 square kilometers. Um, and we were given a, a six month time frame to do that. And it only took them a month to agree to do this. And this, was, I think, it's a far far-reaching uh, view of, of the, the Geological Survey of Botswana all through these years to give you access and uh, allow you to get on, do the work, but don't let you hang on too long. So we only had six months to do this work. We decided that helicopter support was the only way to do it. Um, and so sampling at a density of one sample for 160 square kilometers, which basically was the, the area of, a, of an aerial photograph of the area on these uh, on these aerial photo laydowns, which we used to navigate, no GPS in those days, on the ground. Um, so that's uh, yeah, a 13 by 13 kilometer grid was covered and 20, a, 20, a 20 kilogram sample of, of surface deflation scoops along a one, uh, one kilometer traverse. And that was loaded in a helicopter, uh, screened back to, back to Gaborone and uh, into the lab. And, and then everybody got involved to do the, the picking under the microscope. Carol, Carol Spark, John, John Lee, Andy Moore, the picture, he was also the, the, uh, the, uh, the man at large up in the Kalahari. Simple camps, fascinating time with uh, fuel drops around the, around the Kalahari by land cruiser. So Andy Moore was the operator and chief sampler. He had one helper. You know, you had to navigate uh, on these photo laydowns from clump of bush to clump of bush, which is not easy when there's been these big, big bushfires through. But fortunately, the large clumps do survive. They provide ground support for fuel and food, and then compass traverses on the ground to get yourself orientated and take the sample. Uh, many benefits of that work, game viewing, and uh, also having uh, Al fresco bathing and dining. So processing these samples because we only had six months was top priority. And uh, out of all of that work, we recovered five small kimberlitic kimberlite uh, grains uh, between 0.25 and 0.6 millimeters in diameter in a distinct cluster, which is uh, and a distinct geochemical signature around what we identified as target G01, and surrounding that another one, G02, and then there were a number of others, of which uh, KIKU, which is the Kalkutsi area, um, and uh, target E, uh, a little bit to the southwest, which is also of interest. And Andy Moore has, has the, uh, the honor of having bestowed the name, which he from the local Setswana or Sam Bushman, which means nowhere, and that very much is it. 
Anyway, the first four prospecting licenses of 4,000 square kilometers were obtained based on the location of those five grounds, five ilmenite grains. No other kimbolitic heavy minerals were recovered in those in, the, in that soil. It was very fine grain. Um, but in that uh, aeromagnetic survey, which was found only over the northern part of those 4,000 square caves, there was one incredibly positive bullseye, magnetic bullseye anomaly, which uh, uh, from in retrospect was amazing that it showed up so well because the, the underlying geology is all uh, through basalt, which is extremely noisy magnetically. The drilling of that uh, prominent magnetic bullseye led to the discovery of the GO25 or GOPI25 Kimberlite in 1981. We also discovered six kimberlites at Teku, Tikau, and Kutsi as a result of that program. And, uh, and also from distinctive chemistry, you knew they were different. Um, kimberlitic garment, garnets and other related minerals are not found. But once we had drilled the, the, the GO25 target, there were many favorable G10 garnets and microdiamonds discovered. Those microdiamonds, we realized, um, were sort of many orders of magnitude more than we'd seen before. We realized that this was much more encouraging than those the Molopoca tongs we could find. There's a there's a, a plot of the of the uh, chrome magnesium diagram which shows the the GO1 target uh, group and the, the target group E down the bottom here as well. So Dog group E was in the Dutri area, um, which was due to be extinct. The, uh, so instead of, because we realized the Kalahari was not that deep there, um, we decided to sink small shafts, as was done by the beers at Arafa in the early days. Um, uh, these were fully equipped, so to speak, with uh, ventilation, with fan, and, uh, and uh, material handling, a bucket on the end of, of the rope. Uh, we didn't go down too far, um, but at the base we discovered the uh, the, the kimberlitic heavy minerals came out of this uh, this uh, calcified gravel overlying um, calcified Karoo mudstone, and uh, tracking back those kimberlitic indicator minerals, uh, Andy Moore in fact surveyed around and it took us to the east. Here also there was Echo Age grits exposed, and that also contained kimberlitic. Juneng age, uh, uh, well, that, the, the echo is of Juneng age and had kimberlitic min min minerals in those, which uh, were geochemically similar to, to Juneng, as are the ones of Dutri. So, this is still a puzzle because the kimberlite there has not been discovered, but may in fact be a, a second generation reworking of Juneng ornaments. Anyway, back to Gopi 25. So the first camp on target Joe 25 under the original Gargi tree, the, the Acacia Luderetii, the false umbrella form, of which there are not too many. That's the camp uh, with, the, with the jumper draw. Pretty shortly afterwards, we, we built an airstrip because Sod's Law, the only place where we really want to go and work, there's no airstrip. So that airstrip was built 1,200 meters long with the, the help of local labor, mostly sand bushmen and a few of our other laborers from elsewhere. You can see the developing camp. We moved the mobile diamond recovery plant up there and brought up uh, uh, SCS drilling to undertake the first 15 centimeter diameter dual wheel bulk sampling program. The camp didn't take long for it to develop into prefab pre buildings, uh, electricity supply, water, uh, it was pretty good and extensive water on the Kimberlite pipe, but it was very, very saline. So you had to bring uh, fresh water all the way from, from Kutsi, which was about 110 kilometers to the south. And that was an exercise in, in logistics on our farm. Collecting the samples was, of course, quite something. We used these big black dustbins. Uh, and at one time, Parker, which is the largest importer of black dustbins in Botswana, and even got an inquiry from customs, what on earth going on here. Anyway, those black dustbins were probably contributed to the, the nationwide uh, pickup of litter in Botswana, and we hope that that is so. 
Anyway, groundwater was a big issue. Uh, the north side of the pipe uh, was a very fractured basalt with a high, and the water was very strong, but a very high total dissolved solid, something like 19,000 parts per million. Uh, we put in with a, a reverse osmosis desalination plant, which also had its own issues, but that was largely to provide water for, for the sortex. So at a later stage, uh, this was now well after the De Beers and Dolphins who came in during the phase one drill evaluation. And they were happy with, the, with our, our mini bulk sampling plant and uh, went ahead with that. But in the second phase was a shaft, uh, which was a 6 by 4 profile steel frame with wood shuttering, 150 meters deep. So the, the pipe is 80 meters of, of uh, Kalahari sand over it and about another 30, 40 meters of, of basalt breccia in the throat of the pipe. So the shaft went down 150 meters with a 10 meter sump and then had two 100 meter horizontal drives uh, north and south off the shaft. And that was the, that was the shaft structure the, the, and the material handling um, at that stage uh, from this material. The shaft profile was quite fascinating and in, many, in, in retrospect, it's really sad that that was not ever written up and documented because it's, uh, and, I, and I'm afraid the document, the, the records were probably dispersed far and wide. Well, the Geological Survey of Botswana must still have the original stuff. The, 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 the Kalahari profile there is not as, as we might have imagined from drilling with a, a single layer of calcrete, calcrete is about 35 meters. It in fact, there's sort of a nodular, irregular horizon, which, which has possible root casts in it, which, uh, which indicates that, it, that there were plants growing in the Kalahari at that level, at whatever age that was, which has since been covered up by 35 meters of further sand. <coughs> at 52 meters, there was another calcrete silcrete horizon. And of course, the kimberlite at the bottom, that nice fresh kimberlite. Um, of the hypostatic uh, breccia in the bucket. We did the, the diamond recoveries were all done in, in sampling plants at Arapa. So this material had to be trucked from Gopi, another 120 kilometers to the north to, uh, to, uh, to a sample recovery, a diamond recovery plant at Arapa, and then flown from there to Arapa House in Gavaron for, <coughs> for evaluation. And that's an example of the diamond layout at the time. Here's a section, uh, probably sadly the best I could find, but it comes from Jim Diamonds, uh, who took over the project and shows the, the, uh, the, uh, the profile. You've got the Kalahari, uh, the Kalahari sand, um, and then the, the, the breccia on top, breccia on top here, and then the primary kimberlite here, um, which you have a, a crater facies and uh, basalt breccia on top. Um, and this uh, this is one of the, on the on the one side there's a primary a primary kimberlite which is seems to be intruded up the side. Which, uh, that's probably what significantly brecciated the, the basalt uh, on the side of the, uh, on the, the pipe. Uh, drilling went down to 500 odd meters and went through the basalt uh, at about 400 meters, I believe, into into the, the films of the cave sandstone, which itself is a major aquifer in Botswana. And there was an attempt to, in the area, to use that as a water supply for this, for this project. Um, and I don't know what actually happened with that. Anyway, um, those are, those are um, Gem Diamonds, Gagu Diamond Mines uh, information. After, after three phases of bulk sampling, I'll go into the So we come to the end. So in 1982, the sort of, sort of leads up towards what happened towards the end. Um, it became apparent that the expensive next stage of bulk sampling and of course the evaluation of the diamonds and selling them and all the rest of it, uh, the powers that we decided that they would actually get into bed with the bears who were and still are a world leader in, in diamonds. And so Keck and Cooper signed an agreement with the bears, uh, well, with Mr. Oppenheimer, uh, to earn a 50% interest of the project through expenditure in a fixed period of time. As you can believe, Chris Jennings was not terribly happy with that, and he left Falkenbridge at that stage, sadly. Anyway, the Falkenbridge staff carried on uh, further work on the projects on behalf of the Beers, who funded everything, and eventually relinquished Molopo, Katong, Hikau, Dutri, and focused on the Gopi project. 
the delineation drilling and the first phase bulk sampling, which is by the, the 15 centimeter uh, reverse circulation, followed by underground development and bulk sampling, which is uh, to a large extent supervised by Bruce Cumming. And uh, numerous geophysical surveys were involved aeromagnetic surveys, ground gravity, airborne EM, ground EM, ground gravity. Uh, and lots and lots of them. Uh, and uh, I, I sadly don't have a total number of targets built, but uh, over 200, at least 200 various geophysical and soil targets were drill tested between 1982 and 1990, both by the Beers and Falkenberg in that area. And only four additional smaller diamond different kinloads were discovered on the Gopi property. Those are 130, 136, and 504. And those largely through detailed soil sampling at the end of the day to target the, uh, the uh, drill. The beers completed further underground and dual wall rotary uh, large diameter uh, sampling to earn its 50% interest in the property. And total expenditure during that period was 21 million US dollars to earn that interest was in reality a lot reduced from the original uh, proposal, but uh, be that as it may. Um, the Gopi 25 Kimberlite measures just over 10 hectares at, uh, at 80 kilometers, oh, sorry, 80 meters of depth, completely below the sand cover, and at 300 meters it was reduced uh, down to nine hectares. So it's typically pressure, hyperbissal Kimberlite, and intrudes into the basalt from the great depth. The historic phase one and two uh, resource estimates showed an indicated resource of 77 million tons, grading 20 carats under tons, at that stage valued at $80, carats, $80 a carat from 3,000 carats of diamonds down to the 400 meter level, which of course included the, the bulk underground sample plus the large diameter reverse circulation. Subsequently, phase three incorporated further drilling. Uh, another underground program on different uh, uh, different uh, levels or different directions. Eventually, another sort of 5,000 odd tons of kimberlite were processed. And uh, once they had added to that the, the large diamond program, there were a total of 18,000 tons of kimberlite um, processed, produced 5,100 carats. And a more recent valuation then in 2007 was $121. Okay. So that's the Jim Diamonds have taken over the project uh, at their data. So there's a summary of the final picture of the diamonds of the grades and recoveries over the, over the time with the box samples, 5,100 carats. Uh, the grade doesn't change very much over, over time. It depends on your cuts and your blocks and all the rest, but the value changes significantly. From 1989 at $80 a carat, 2007 at $121 a carat. In the production phase of Gem Diamonds, 2011, at uh, $223 a carat, and then it goes down in 2015 at $162, 2016 at $152. The photograph is a, is a sample of the of the diamond recovery that are found during the phase one. And that was one of the that is one of our historic uh, pictures. I have it on my wall right here. And uh, includes uh, you see that nice little yellow fellow there, some lovely um, octahedra, and some beautiful clear crystals. And I do recall there were one or two blue, blue stones in there as well. So there were some, from small samples, there were some very encouraging um, uh, aspects. So as a summary, uh, it's no point in going through it. And I think you'll see in the, in the recording, and if you want to go back to the detail, but systematic work um, over periods of time, uh, the, the, between the 1980s through to 1989, uh, was all in prospecting licenses. Uh, you know, uh, Botswana had a very efficient um, licensing um, and renewal system, encouraged you to do the work, turn over the ground, submit the reports. And then um, amendments to the Act later on allowed for retention licenses, which was put quite, quite a, a heavy uh, penalty with, with annual payments on it. But that went on until 1998, when they undertook the further, the further um, underground and surface drilling to, the, to develop the, uh, the final resource. Um, so, 
in May 2009, Jen Diamonds uh, acquired uh, from the Beers Parker Group, uh, its, um, group, or from uh, by then Parker Group was a subsidiary of Extrata. It was clearly of no interest to Extrata. They, they were actually very good in carrying on whatever commitments were to, to maintain the property. But they sold the property to PGM Diamonds for $34 million cash. And as you recall, uh, the original expenditure uh, for the beers to earn in was 21 million. There was a significant amount spent after that uh, jointly by the peers and parking I don't have those figures. But I guess 34 million was probably a fair uh, dollar for dollar return. Um, the original feasibility by the beers and parking bridge was an open pit with a horrendous uh, impact and was not economic at all. Um, Jim took the alternative view and decided on an underground uh, program and instituted a, a, a study which um, embarked on a, uh, on a decline shaft, which they completed and started the production from that level down to about the, I think it was about 200 meter level. Sadly, they had some, uh, some fatalities on sinking that shaft, which, which was, were in fact, I believe due to I guess the lack of understanding of, the, of that uh, that calcrete horizon that did not provide any support um, to the sand. But it was a challenge, uh, I think, to get the, this, this mining license through in that the, the, the project is situated within the central Kalahari game reserve, but the Botswana government has consistently allowed mineral exploration in the game reserve. Um, this has been a, a, a bone of contention with many, many parties, but uh, I think that uh, with time and management and everything else, I think the, the, the decision was correct. There is very little more that's been discovered, if any, and certainly not uh, uh, diamond difference kimberlite. So time goes by and eventually the, the Kalahari Game Reserve can return to its uh, more pristine um, character. Anyway, the capital investment of, of Gem Diamonds was $85 million, which I think is a, is quite a nice figure for a project like that. And was very, very innovative in many respects um, with the, the, the sort of very temporary but very efficient camp, the access, the logistics, everything had to be carted by road. New road access in from the Pepe on the, on the eastern border of the Kalahari Central Park or Grand Desert. And that's a, a, a Google view of the site. The extra uh, on the left and the Kimberlite in the middle, and the uh, or the mine site is to the north of the Kimberlite, where the, the decline comes in from the north side, and the extra on the, on the top right. Uh, quite nice to see that. And if you're flying from, from Gaborone to Naun, uh, you generally fly a little bit to the north of this. In fact, the, the Gaborone, the old, the old Gopi airstrip, was used as a marker by pilots in the 80s, uh, flying to Maum, um, enabled them to fly direct route across the Kalahari instead of routing via Arapa, which was the previous uh, aerial marker for early flight um, up to, to Maum uh, in the early days. So there's another picture of the diamonds from, from Gem Diamonds and from their work um, and their feasibility discovery in, in 20, 2014, um, reported an, an insight value of 4.9 billion US dollars in that Kimberlite. Um, and those are, those are typical diamonds from the 5,100 carat cycle. Some really pretty fellows there. So you see a peak on the top of it. This is new, new on my side. Um, some pictures of the mine as it is now or as it uh, was in 2011. So to just go through the brief history. Um, uh, discovered in 1981. Um, the beer spent $21 million, I guess, uh, on top of what Barkenbridge had spent, which was maybe another one or $2 million before that. Um, Gem Diamonds acquired it for $34 million. They spent $85 million. In 2017, they put it on care and maintenance. It has an insight you value of $4.9 billion, and they sold it in June last year to local Botswana company for $5.4 million, which I believe is probably only the value of their of the environmental responsibilities. So, sad but true. 
So after 1982, several other companies conducted further work in, in the, the large areas covered by Falkenbridge's reconnaissance license. Some companies were critical of our exploration techniques, wide aeromagnetic line spacing was, was focused on the biggest targets. We knew that there was significant Kalahari cover, the bigger the target, the better. However, uh, sometimes, despite use of these sometimes more detailed, more advanced methods, none of these companies are known to have made economically significant new discoveries in these areas. Uh, an additional four Kimberlites have been discovered, or additional Kimberlites have been discovered in all four new fields discovered by Falkenberg. The additional, uh, the higher resolution aeromagnetics were flown at closer line spacing, lower altitude, airborne EFM, and ground gravity surveys have been used to confirm targets for drilling and defined shape. Detailed soil sampling for cumulative minerals is still successfully in use. And Pangolin Diamond, led by Leon Daniels, ex Falkenberg, with his, with his encouraging partner, Chris Jennings, um, is still in action and uh, is an encourage, interesting program to follow. So all these new discoveries have been smaller than the 500 millimeter, uh, meter minimum target uh, diameter flown which was defined by the flight lines facing flown by Parkinus. Some, including some originally discovered by Parkinus, have been found to be slightly diamondiferous. Very few have progressed to the initial bulk sampling stage, and none have been bulk sampled by sharks in the sun of the The exception is Petra Diamonds KX36, which is a small five hectare pipe under 80 kilometers of Kalahari, 80 meters Kalahari, uh, discovered by high resolution aeromatic and full out uh, soil sampling located to the southeast of, of Falkenberg. So Falkenberg's discovery of the economically significant Gopi 25 Kimberlite is an internationally recognized example of uh, highly successful exploration using then state-of-the-art technology. Falkenberg set up techniques for recording of our data, geophysical, geochemical, microdiamond, the five device factors with Don Gurney to predict the highest priority Kimberlite, and this data organization enabled Falkenbridge to save tens of millions of dollars by eliminating the need for very extensive time snooping and unnecessary bulk sampling of every Kimberlite discovery. So this was 62 in seven years. It would have taken an awful long time to bulk sample all of those. The technology trend set by Falkenbridge in that period formed the basis for the highly successful diamond exploration program conducted by DHP in Canada leading to the discovery of the Akati Kimberlite in 1991, which was developed at a capital cost of $940 billion, uh, million dollars and paid back that capital in four years, as well as subsequent discoveries. The exploration manager for BHP was Hugo Dummett, who teamed up with Chuck Kupke, who was a, a name, to make this momentous discovery. And the book Barren Lands by Kevin Krejcik is a, well worth, a worthwhile read on this story. Ultimately, it was the high cost of bulk sampling and evaluation, which combined with low metal prices at the time, which led to the joint venture of the beers. Um, and otherwise, Falkenbridge may have gone on to make that monumental Canadian discovery in their backyard in Canada. Um, Chris Jennings later became involved in, in work leading to discovery of the nearby Diavik Kimberlite in, in Northwest Canada with ABBA Resources and Rio Tinta. And our Gopi 25, at one start, is still waiting for its day in the sun. Thank you. Thanks, Kurt. Uh, anybody there? I'd be happy to answer questions. Excellent, John. Thank you very, very much. Thank you for all the preparation and all the detailed slides. What a career. How amazing. Anybody, you can open your mic or raise your hand and I'll recognize you. But anybody, you can go ahead. Will you unshare your screen so we can see your face and then turn on your video? Yeah. Yeah. Hello, Jimmy. Yes. <laughs> Jim, do you want to ask a question? Uh, you, Kate, you have to stop the, stop the video. Okay. Right. Oh, okay. Thank you. Jim, go ahead. Jimmy, are you still there? Well, nothing, nothing really to ask. It is uh, 
And, um, you know, amazing story, some, um, several amazing people in it. And, uh, um, you know, it all goes to show what can be done if uh, one applies herself and thinks a little bit broader in things like this. It's absolutely amazing, amazing success story. But in the closing chapters and having listened to Bill's presentation last week, uh, I don't think uh, um, Gugu is going to go anywhere in terms of the, the diamond prices and things like that. So kind of all in vain, but uh, for these discoveries that were done in Canada, um, it was a starting ground. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And uh, yeah, it's difficult to know what the Botswana company um, pro civils are going to do with it. Um, that may be just a lead into the Botswana government actually taking it over and I don't know. Uh, you know, governments running mining ventures is not a happy story, as we know what happened with BCL, Levy Pickery. So uh, maybe it uh, should be turned into a museum for, for, for trans Kalahari travelers to, to come and view and, uh, and experience what can be done. Anybody else? I certainly appreciate when? all the attendance and. Uh, and part of this uh, story was uh, on John uh, Visto's instigation to lead on to what some of the, the benefits of, of the, the operating environment in, in Botswana were uh, in those days. And uh, I have a couple of slides which I can show if you want to get, which actually uh, highlight that. And I don't know if you want to enlarge on the subject at this stage, um, we'll leave it for another episode. But it uh, highlights the fact that, that really it was it's access to the access to the land uh, management of the licensing process by the at that stage the geological survey um, access to the previous prospectors information access free basically free access to the the, the uh, government flown surveys which at that stage was only a, a four kilometer line spaced reconnaissance air magnetic survey of Botswana. But that, uh, that survey and its subsequent technology reports by Des Pretorius uh, of the Economic Geology Research Unit at BITS identified an intersecting fracture system right at Gofu. And that also added value to our, our, uh, our encouragement in that area and the focus of our activity. So, you know, Botswana has gone on to, to fly many surveys and compile data and has got the whole area, the whole country covered with largely uh, very detailed aeromagnetics and in Eastern Botswana uh, aerial radiometrics, which were flown in the, in the, in the mid-80s, and is freely available, or was freely available then. Um, subsequently, things have got bogged down. The, the, uh, the, um, the change in, in, uh, in, in management of the licensing system from the geological survey to the mines department, as well as the, the, the the loss of many of their geologists, uh, good geologists, to the, the minerals boom in the in the 90s and the 2000s, uh, unfortunately has left them a little bit unprepared and underprepared to manage the system properly. And uh, my later experiences in Botswana with the impact minerals on the uranium project and the low and got licenses very uh, easily granted in the late 2000s. Renewals got slower and slower and slower and eventually ground to a halt. And uh, I, I've not been involved there since 2014. And I don't, I don't know if it's improved very much. And that's a sad story. Um, but it, it had, the right, had the right ingredients of the day, access to land, access to the information. You apply good science of the day and spend money and you will be successful. John, I think we've lost quite a few of our participants, so maybe if you've got additional slides, we should keep it for another day. But I have a, and there's a question here from, from somebody. <clears throat> Let me read it. But reverse circulation is still not used too much in South Africa, especially in unconsolidated aquifers. Should be standard and faster than mud, rotary, and heavy mineral mining along the coast. Machines are brought in from us. Clear with um, exploration dependent on ground world water first question mark 
must have helped for groundwater exploration in the area? Question mark. You want to comment on that? Well, interesting. I mean, the Kalahari is a desert, as we know. And I mean, a, a desert as defined in that environment is, is lack of surface water. It's, it's a very productive environment from a vegetation point of view and the associating uh, wildlife, but it's a, it's a desert from a lack of surface water. Um, it's very difficult to find uh, good drinking water. Every, every, most places you drill in the Kalahari, you will find some groundwater at the base of the Kalahari. It is very saline, uh, largely a, probably a product of, of filtering through the Karoo basalt. Um, and uh, the, the only decent uh, groundwater in Botswana in, has been found related to the, the, uh, the cave sandstone or the, the, the Karoo sandstone aquifers around the edge. Um, I believe that was a major water source for Arafa and has been also um, for, for Johnny. So, uh, yeah, I don't know what else to add to that. Um, water was always an issue. Always an issue. Alan, you want to have a final word? Sorry. Sorry, can I just add to that? And that was the reason for the jumper drilling. Because jumper drills, drilling uses far less water than, than any of the, the, the mechanized, uh, more mechanized uh, drilling systems, either open, open hole or reverse circulation. So uh, that's the reason why jump drilling was so, so, so widely used in Botswana historically. There's somebody who started talking. You want to ask a question, whoever it was? Amy, uh, she's daughter. Thank you for helping with the slides. Helen, you want to have a final word? Um, yes, thanks, uh, Pat. Yeah, I'd just like to thank John. That was really a brilliant talk. Um, I, you know, I think the difficulties of operating in that environment cannot be underestimated. You know, the roads are terrible. The as John mentioned, the water is not there. Just that logistical exercise is something astronomical. If you haven't been there yourself, you can't comprehend it. So besides the logistics, the science that they've applied was something uh, quite spectacular. So it's really, it's really quite an achievement. And thank you so much, John. And thanks for your input into the, into the, um, the science of geology. Thank Pleasure. Thank you, Alan. Well, once thank again, John, thank you very much. I'm going to close the meeting now. Any final thank goodbye? You. Thank you, everybody who joined us. Stay thank well. You. Thank you, John. Goodbye. Yes. Great talk. Thank you.